on today's World Insight with TNY. Two short-range missiles fired on Thursday from the DPRK. What's with the timing and what's the message? And volunteer work inside the DPRK, the real situation on the ground. The need for DPRK is of 12 million Swiss francs. We have received only 33%. Here is our host, Dan Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. We begin from the Korean Peninsula, where the DPRK fired two short-range ballistic missiles from the eastern port city of Wonsan on Thursday morning. They flew about 430 kilometers to the east and reached an altitude of 50 kilometers before splashing down. This is after the Kim Trump meeting on June the 30s at the border village of Panmunjom, where they agreed to resume denuclearization talks. The DPRK fired two short-range missiles on Thursday morning. The second missile appeared to be a new design that had not been seen before. It was the DPRK's second launch of short-range projectiles this year, as the country fired two similar projectiles on May 9. South Korea said it was working with the U.S. to monitor launches. South Korea and U.S. militaries are sharing detailed information about North Korea's firing of projectiles, which are presumed to be short-range missiles and conducting an analysis. South Korean government has been closely monitoring the related moves of North Korea, and we urge North Korea to stop such actions that do not help the efforts to relieve tensions on the Korean peninsula. The U.S. State Department reiterated diplomatic engagement with the DPRK. Department spokesperson Morgan Ortagus said, We continue to urge the North Koreans to resolve all of the things that the President and that Chairman Kim have talked about through diplomacy. This is my honor. Thursday's missile launches come after DPRK leader Kim and Mr. Trump agreed to revive denuclearization talks with working level negotiations set for mid July. But things soured after the U.S. and South Korea announced a joint military exercise in August. Kim slammed South Korea for double dealing with the purchase of ultra modern offensive weapons and holding joint military exercises with the United States. Earlier this week, the DPRK leader also inspected a new submarine which would raise the range of the country's missiles. What's next for Korean Peninsula diplomacy? <laughs> What's next for Korean Peninsula diplomacy? In Washington, D.C., Michael O'Hallen, senior fellow from the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence, also director of the Research for Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. Joining us in Washington, D.C. as well, Su Kim, a former CIA North Korean analyst and currently a policy analyst at the RAND Corporation. Welcome to both of you. And also in our Beijing studio, it's an honor to have Zhao Tong, fellow at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for global policy. Let me start by asking you, Mr. O'Hanlon, since you are a security expert, what does it mean, the short-range missiles and the earlier submarine test? What does it say about the DPRK's capability, nuclear capability particularly? Greetings. Well, uh, there are two ways to interpret the tests, I think. One is in narrow military terms as uh, modest improvements in capabilities that North Korea already has had, but perhaps these missiles could be a bit more dependable. There's some talk that the missiles might be more powerful and could fly lower uh, and therefore evade radar longer. I don't know if that's really a meaningful improvement. I don't know enough about the flight characteristics of the test to be sure. But I think that's one way to look at these. But I think the more compelling way is that North Korea is simply trying to remind the world that they are not happy with the current state of affairs, mm. with the sanctions uh, that have been applied against them being so powerful, and they're worried that the momentum in the U.S. Uh, and DPRK nuclear negotiations has been lost, and that this is sort of the best moment for them to try to get a deal with Donald Trump still in the White House uh, and still yeah. investing a lot of personal time and diplomacy in the, in the nuclear issue, and so they don't want to be forgotten 
and they want to make sure that they turn up the temperature to get mm -hmm. attention in Seoul and Washington rather than have this issue sort of recede and just be put on the back burner because they can't really yeah. live very well with the current sanctions. I believe that was the message out of Hanoi. Okay. I think that's the fundamental reality. Ms. Kim, of course, there are mixed reports so far from different sources about exactly the two tests to mean the submarine earlier and now the third range missiles. Now we see Washington trying to dismiss to a certain extent the importance technologically about these two tests. Obviously, there is also negotiation in Washington's mind not to set too high a bar for the enemy, quote unquote. Uh, Ms. Kim, what do you say, given your knowledge of the security issue as well, about these two tests and the sophistication of these two tests? Well, I would say that uh, the United States uh, downplaying the, the severity of yesterday's uh, missile tests is an indication that they do not want to elevate tensions right now with North Korea, especially with the, uh, the momentum being stalled and there's interest on the United States part to, to get something across the table to North Korea so that we can get a deal. Now, as far as the, the technical specifications go, I understand that this is a, a 600 uh, mile range uh, that is uh, considered to be a violation of the United States Security Council uh, resolutions. Um, that clearly uh, ban the, the testing of ballistic missile tests. So uh, to, to elevate the status, to, to give importance to it, would be to, to give a nod to the North Koreans that um, we are acknowledging what's going on and that um, the threshold for pain and when it comes to dealing with North Korea's uh, nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities has gotten up so high that um, we've, bec we've become to, to accept um, these threats as just part of the norm and to mm. be actually a little bit grateful that um, things could not be any worse. Mm. If you look at that, uh, Mr. Zhao, this is uh, not long after the so-called uh, restart of denuclearization talk agreed by the two leaders coming from DPRK and the United States. And this time, the DPRK media particularly focused on the role of uh, the leader in DPRK in uh, making sure the launch is successful. As we know, it fired two short-range missiles on Thursday morning, reports said. This second missile appeared to be, quote, a new design that had not been seen before. They both reached an altitude of 50 kilometers before splashing down, indicating they are short-range missiles and they fly low and could make in-flight guidance adjustments. Both capabilities exploit weakness of Patriot missile batteries and THAAD anti missile defense system. Now we all remember those key words, that system uh, in the region. Mr. Zhao, your comment. Well, I uh, slightly disagree with our American colleague that North Korea only made modest technical improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this type of missile that North Korea just tested uh, indicate that they do have some uh, maneuverability during flight. Um, based on the illustration on uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, computer screen, uh, the, fl the missile actually flied up first and then turned downward and then glided for a little while before pulling up again and then uh, strike target eventually. So that represents some, you know, uh, you know, a, a capability that is similar to what we often call a, gl a booster glider. Mm. Um, maybe that not as advanced as a typical boost glider but uh, still it represents a very impressive technical uh, breakthrough on the North Korean part, especially considering all the harsh sanctions and resource restraints on North Korea. What is the function of a booster glider, Mr. Zhao? Uh, that's a capability um, ma that enables a missile to maneuver uh, during its flight and so that it can evade the interception by missile defense systems. Um, so North Korea could indicate uh, by showing this capability that it can neutralize the stat and Patriot systems deployed by South Korea. So it's a message to South Korea and the United States that given time, North Korea can make more harm. It can imp make more significant improve improvement to its current uh, strategic nuclear capabilities. Mm.
Uh, Mr. Ohana, it's very interesting that Mr. Zhao, given the very last sentence of his answer, he mentioned North Korea is giving the message both to the United States and to South Korea. But that's exactly what I really want to ask. Is it a message to uh, South Korea, the neighbor, uh, or uh, is it a message to Washington, uh, which has been agreeing earlier, just a month ago, uh, some denuclearization talk, and it didn't happen yet? Well, first of all, Mr. Zhao does make a good point that uh, when I say there's only a modest improvement, I actually am not sure that the Patriot system is going to be able to intercept systematically and comprehensively all the previous North Korean missiles that were simpler because missile defense systems don't always work and they get saturated. They run out of missiles. So, I, But I think Mr. Zhao still does make a good point that, in fact, maneuverability is a, a meaningful military step forward. So uh, I will acknowledge that uh, mm -hmm. very valid point. Um, in terms of who, who's being messaged here, whether it's Seoul or Washington, you know, I think the North Koreans uh, are just trying to break the logjam in the negotiations any way they can. And uh, the only person who seems to get spared their, their uh, invective and their insult is Donald Trump. Uh, I think they've decided to protect him uh, yeah. because Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump have this special relationship. And they also understand that President Trump can be a little bit volatile, and so you don't want to risk getting on his bad side. But they're prepared to uh, disrupt relations with John Bolton or Mike Pompeo or President Moon of South Korea, depending on what they think will give a new impetus to the negotiation process. And so I don't really think fundamentally uh, they're trying to distinguish that much South Korea from the United States in mm. general terms. At this particular moment, I think what they're trying to do is get all of our attention because I think Washington is a little bit paralyzed by a debate inside the administration as to whether to go for complete North Korean denuclearization all in one agreement or whether to be more step by step um, and lift some of the sanctions in exchange for uh, elimination of, of the nuclear production infrastructure as sort of an interim step. Mm -hmm. And I think, so therefore, Washington um, and Seoul are both being messaged by North Korea at the moment, I believe. Interesting. Ms. Kim, therefore, what do you consider as the reason why Washington has not been yet proactive in trying to restart the talk? Is it because of the reason mentioned by Mr. O'Hannon about this internal debate as to what should be the end result, at least of this round of talks? Or is it Washington feeling that the time is on its clock and therefore uh, let the DPRK hang out there and make them nervous as a part of the negotiation strategy, Ms. Kim? Well, I, I do agree that um, there seems to be a disagreement or a disconnect between um, in, in the stated goal, the end goal of, of denuclearization of North Korea, um, whether that's going to be a freeze or a complete package um, where North Korea completely dismantles its facilities, where it comes up with a declaration of all its weapons and sites, um, that's, that's still under debate. Um, but what's really interesting is that it's, the timeline is not actually in favor of Washington. It's always been in North Korea's favor. And for the United States to quickly agree to, uh, I would say, a fourth summit now uh, with North Korea would be to, uh, without having really prepared a strategy, without really having prepared basically what it is that we want from North Korea, what we want to see in this fourth round of talks, um, without having that clear vision, we walk into the room again uh, facing North Korea without having anything to come back to. Mm. Uh, that's going to put a lot of criticism on the administration. Um, you know, one, two, three strikes already. To have a fourth strike without a, a declaration, without a, a really a tangible denuclearization agreement or anything mm. to get the process going is really going to place criticism on President Trump. And we understand also that he has to think about the elections that are coming up next year as well. So there's a lot of um, you know, administrative and also um, personal interests um, yes. that are at play right now. Yes, indeed. Uh, Mr. Zhao, therefore, it's very interesting, uh, the situation. Now, we all know DPRK is already a de facto nuclear state uh, in a way. And therefore, for the DPRK, it is a continuity if they continue to do 
uh, further tests as they did over the past uh, few weeks. Uh, however, it does want to talk to Washington, but it does not trust Washington. So if we were in the shoes of the DPRK, what do you think the most likely choices they are going to make, including the recent show off and some of the future, immediate future actions? Well, I think that really depends on what's the exact domestic situation in DPRK, especially in the economic domain. Mm. Um, people have been speculating why after so long uh, uh, under serious economic sanctions, North Korean economy is still doing okay, North Korea is still holding on, uh, rejecting, you know, complete denuclearization. You know, there are two theories. One is North Korea is really doing okay economically. Um, you know, it can get uh, critical resources. It can uh, make its uh, economy develop by conducting domestic reform. The other theory is, no, actually North Korea is simply putting on a show. It is painting a picture of a stable economic situation, but in fact, it is running out of critical resources and it cannot hold, hold down for uh, much longer. Uh, that second theory makes some sense. Uh, I think it can explain some of the recent stepping up of tensions by DPRK, the resuming of short-range missile tests multiple times mm -hmm. so far, the official revelation of its uh, ballistic missile summary. That's you know first time since uh, the start of the diplomatic uh, charm offensive by North Korea uh, early last year. So that you think it's more internal pressure, domestic uh, politics uh, driven pressure rather than a, a trying to test Washington? I think it could be driven by a grave economic situation in North mm. Korea. Uh, North Korea badly, may badly needs uh, economic sanction relief. So it is using these uh, military provocations to pressure Washington right. to make more and quicker concessions on the critical issue of sanction relief. Mm. Uh, Mr. M M Ms. Kim, uh, let me come back to you because you've been analyzing North Korea for quite a long time. Now, we do understand coming from the UN public source that there have been drought and floods and natural disasters. The output of the uh, food has been smaller than it used to be. The food proportion for every North uh, Korean have been going down from 500 um, kilo to about 300, which is almost half uh, than they used to be. So uh, would you like to help us understand how does that work, the internal pressure or agenda difficulties with uh, the, uh, the so-called uh, international relations the strategy, it's a security strategy, Ms. Kim, if you can. I think we have to go back to the, the, the nucleus of North Korea, uh, and, and that's the Kim Jong-un regime. Mm. Um, even though North Korea might be having issues with the drought, with the food issue, we just saw recently that um, it was so hesitant to, to accept South Korea's food aid package that it rejected it. So right. that also indicates that you know, it's not just about the pressing needs of the people, but it's about what Kim needs to get in order to achieve his ultimate goal. And that goal has al al it's always been for North Korea to, to one, to break the South Korea-U.S. alliance, um, mm. to expel the U.S. forces out of South Korea, and to, um, to get rid of the deterrence um, in, in the region, and to bring South Korea to the point where it feels so intimidated that um, it will succumb to North Korea's demands and to actually ultimately reunify the two countries. So the internal factors certainly do play a role in, in, in shifting Kim Jong-un's calculus a little bit, but he's not really, um, he's not really straight from his course of, of building up his nuclear capabilities right. and using it as bargaining chips to, to talk to the United States, to talk to South Korea, and also to, to engage regional partners like, uh, like China and Russia to, to take his position. Yeah. Mr. O'Hanlon, since uh, Ms. Kim mentioned South Korea a lot in her answer, this is a fascinating question. We see there have been a lot of issues recently South Korea got itself or being got into. Uh, for example, trade issue with Japan, 
uh, the alliance issue with uh, the United States, uh, whether South Korea trusts the United States now in this uh, triangle relationship, and what would that mean for South Korea relation with the United States, and the joint military exercise as a result of that, South Korea was pressured by North Korea about you know, with the latest test. So a lot of things going on right here about South Korea. What do you make of the, now the realities that South Korea is facing right now? It's been working to facilitate the Panmunjom meeting between Trump and Kim, and now South Korea is facing a huge dilemma of its own without any help from any of the two. Yes, South Korea is in a tough spot, although I actually believe the U.S.-South Korea alliance is in pretty good shape by comparison, let's say, with 2017 when President Trump came in and obviously had a lot of negative views towards that alliance. And then in 2018, even though things were somewhat repaired, he continued to force this issue of demanding more host nation payment by South Korea for the costs that U.S. forces incur by being based in South Korea. It, this year, it's been, you know, at least the last few months, it feels to me a little quieter in the U.S. ROK relationship overall. We also have not seen a big new escalation on the trade front uh, in, you know, bilateral uh, e economic relations. So I actually think the United States is proving at the moment to be a pretty dependable friend of South Korea. Mm. But the ROK Japan relationship is in very bad shape and uh, frankly remarkably bad shape. I think it would have been quite difficult to predict just how far backward things could go right. and how much the history question could come back to the fore again. And of course Chinese understand this very well because Chinese and Japanese have a lot of the same kinds of historical issues and Chinese have a lot of the same criticisms of Japan uh, based on behavior in the early 20th century that Korea does. Right. And so I think both Korea and China have deep suspicions about Japan and any time there is an issue that reignites that history question, it really proves to be an unresolved matter in dealings with both the South Korean and the Chinese people. Well, I guess maybe the U.S. is more now thinking about, if it does think in that way, uh, where to go and whether a strategy already drawn up. Uh, Mr. Zhao, about your comment here, you know, denuclearization talk is never just about denuclearization talk, isn't it? It's about security guarantee. It's about about the relations in the region, it's about where the potential is economically for the region, it's about the alliance relationship, all of this very complicated issue. So what do you make of this very entangled things now reflected in the latest test by the DPRK, Mr. Zhao? And, and adding to the complexity of that, all right, there, go is, ahead, sir. there is always uh, misleading messages. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, North Korea you know, officially declared why it was testing missiles was because he was, uh, North Korea is displeased with the joint exercises and the North, uh, South Korean introduction of uh, F-35 uh, mm. fighter jets. But in fact, you know, those are not uh, South Korean's fault. The joint exercises were already scaled down and uh, the introduction of the F-35 has been in the de deliberation in South Korea for a while. Yeah. So I think um, we have to lo look beyond the surface, look beyond their de uh, declaratory policy. In terms of denuclearization, there is a recent change of North Korean position. They used to focus a lot on economic sanction relief, but recently they are re-emphasizing importance for South Korea and the United States to provide security guarantee. However, I don't think that's the real intent of North Korea. Uh, North Korea is unlikely to trust the security guarantee from South Korea and the United States. But in fact, I think that's the North Korean tactic to say that, okay, in order for you to pro provide a real security guarantee, you have to reduce or decrease or even get rid of the military alliance, uh -huh. which I know you won't be able to do. So let's talk about, you know, what is easier, <laughs> which is economic <laughs> sanction relief. Wow. So it's, you know, yeah, the, the different signaling force message uh, is indeed make this game even more complicated. Well, I hope it's a game, but it's not, right? It's a very serious matter. We're talking about the security of the region. Before we go, may I ask a very bold question to every one of you, and just one answer, one sentence to explain why you think so. When do you think the restart of the denuclearization talk would really happen between DPRK and the United States? Uh, Mr. O'Hannon, one answer, one reason. 
probably this fall because I really think both countries need it. And President Trump needs this for his reelection campaign as a major foreign policy success. I North see. Korea needs the sanctions relief. Mr. Zhao? Well, I hope the operational negotiation would uh, restart soon, but the summit level meeting between presidents uh, looks like it will take longer to take place. Got it. Ms. Kim, last but not least. Well, we have to keep in mind the year and deadline from Kim Jong Un. So um, I, I would assume that working level talks or something of that nature would be, you know, trickling up to that point. Um, and that's because, um, as the previous right. panels have said, that it's because of the elections. Yes. Su Kim, Michael Hanlon, Zhao Tong, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Thank you. And you're watching World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing. Still to come on the program. Volunteer work inside the DPRK, the real situation on the ground, right after this break from someone who visited the country for the seventh time. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Drought, heat waves, and sanctions. These are just some of the most pressing issues facing the DPRK right now, making the work of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent more urgent than ever. Earlier, I sat down with the regional director for Asia Pacific of the International Federation of Red Cross, Javier Castanano on the organization's efforts in dealing with challenges in the DPRK. Before that, take a look at this. The DPRK is grappling with a looming drought and inevitable food shortages. The UN said more than 10 million people won't have enough food. Dry spells and low rainfall produced the slowest harvest in a decade last year. One in five children stunted as a result of chronic malnutrition. Food rations have been cut from 410 grams per day in 2015 to 300 grams this year. With harvests expected to yield 20% less this year, it's been a struggle to feed more than 25 million people. Many nations responded to the UN's appeal for humanitarian support for the DPRK, with China one of the biggest donors over the years. But the UN says, under tough sanctions, humanitarian aid to the DPRK has been under increasing strain. What kinds of uh, humanitarian emergency uh, products you have distributed? Well, in this case was uh, a significant amount of uh, water pumps in order to ensure that they go from place to place to ensure that the crops will receive at least a, a percentage of water that is needed to guarantee the minimum production. Mm. In areas that uh, the conditions of the ground is sandy, and that means that uh, it requires even uh, 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 three to four times of, of, of water pumps uh, working in each of the areas. But in those communities where nothing happened, then the situation is severe, it's going to be more difficult. Yeah, but many say what you're doing right now in DPRK is still very limited. It's like a drop of water in the big sea. Let me put it as, as a practical example. Our appeal for the support that we need for DPRK is of 12 million Swiss francs. We have received only 33 percent. So money is one of the biggest issues that we have in order to be able to provide the support. Then if you look into the fertilizers, to enter f fertilizers is, is not an easy task to achieve. And all the equipment that is needed and all the support that is required if uh, we don't have the necessary water, it is not only about the crops, it's about the health of the people. Yes. So this has a combination of different effects. How much is the sanctions against the DPRK right now have an impact on your work, including your funding and also the soliciting of support from all over the world? Well, I would say that there is an intended uh, effect that I have on, on, on the delay of the, of the time. So the more time that delays, for example, to enter yes. the logistic, uh, the, all the goods that we want to have, will, will have an impact. Now we have been distributed 
all that we requested, but uh, uh, last year we had a, a delay of five months. So Just think about that. What it means that in practical terms is that there is a time for harvesting, there is a time to plant the seeds. Yes. There is a time uh, to, to put water pipes, and there is a time when winter comes, forget it, you will not put a water pipe. So those are the unintended consequences, uh, but luckily we have been managed to achieve now. Mm. We, are, we have progressed uh, steadily this year, very much, in terms of our objectives. Well, recently in Songhang Yang, we were visiting one of the farms, and, and their objective is to have a 40,000 eggs in the production of the chicken fr uh, farms that are distributed. Mm. So we don't only see this, we accompany. We are not just making one visit. Mm. We are accompanying the communities because part of our support is to provide the technical support to the farmers as well yes. in terms of how they perform their duties. The other example is a, a, a beautiful story of a lady that right now her name, you I get cannot your get mind. it, yeah. 80 years old, you know? And we went to visit her house, and she said to us, all my life, I wanted to have the opportunity to open the tap of my water and comes to my house, and now is there. Yeah. Those are small examples that are multiplied by thousands. Mm. Now, also, you've been working with the local community by uh, working with the kids, for example, on hygiene issues. I saw some of the videos. It was really a lovely scene. Uh, but once again, how would you guarantee what you see is going to be there and it's going to be really having an impact on the local community? I visit DPRK several times uh, uh, and I have seen these kids... Seven times already yeah, seven in DPRK times during already. your term this time. I have seen, not these kids, several of the children that are, uh, are trained on, on, on hygiene uh, messages and music. They are singing about hygiene kids, how to wash their hands. How to be careful about uh, any dengue, how to be careful about the garbage, if it's the garbage, and how to take control of, of, of the environment. They have music about tree planting and why uh, reforestation is very good. Mm -hmm. So for different of the activities that we do as a Red Cross. It's like an advocacy almost. Is the way they teach children peer to peer on how to behave in order to take care of their own health and their, their do own Do you know self. how to sing that song? <laughs> I would love to. Next time I will, I, I will, try, I will try it. <laughs>
for us is, is hard because we are in the field. We are trying to reach to the people that, that need, but the competition of different agendas, it is not always on the top of the decision makers. So the decision makers, the indifference comes in, in that uh, point of view. There seems to be a political tendency, as some say, of looking inward rather than looking beyond the borders. Well, let me pull you in, in, in with other words. You know, this is the only planet that we have. And this is the only humanity that we know. Well, they say, oh, you say that all the time. You say that for 10 years or 20 years, but we are losing jobs, so why would I care? Because that costs more. You know, it's, it's guaranteed I know that you can convince me, but it's easy to convince the other party. A disaster costs, an investment of $1 costs $16 in today's world, and that affects the economy. What is it like for you? I know you've been working in Haiti, in South America, and now in Asia, some of the countries most suffering from natural disasters and even political complexities. What do you think are the most important qualities of people like you on the ground in order to deal with the situation? Well, the first one is commitment. The second one, you know, you have to be a truly humanitarian in terms of, of being principled in action. Uh, that sounds abstract. It does sound an abstract, but uh, it is a behavior that uh, gives you trust. Give me an example. You know, if, if, if you commit something that may affect the integrity of the organization in terms of how you perform or how it's done, mm. or if you are not, uh, if you are start playing games, that will affect the trust of the organization. Was there a time when you were trying to make things happen, of course, for the common good, but then there's a realization, if I do that, maybe there would be a very bad trade-off. Were there times? Many times. What is the latest? You know, w w w Bangladesh, I would say, in Cox's Bazar, in the operation of Cox's Bazar, uh, where you have uh, 1.4 million people in camps, mm. when you see there is a big need, big humanitarian challenges, of course, you, you have those moments. But uh, again, you have to rely on your experience in, in how to handle uh, the situations and, and to make sure that whatever we do is focused in terms of our humanitarian action. So you have to hold yourself back in a way. Many times. Many times, but always is for, a com uh, for the good. You know, the pro 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 proportionality of our action. Yes. If we think on the proportionality of our, our action, uh, sometimes moving back is good because you will reach to the people that need. Does it kill you in a way? Does it hurt um, as a person? I would say, yeah, affects. But uh, probably the commitment is bigger and we are uh, optimistic by, by, by definition you in terms to. of how we work. So we will, we, all, we will put the commitment as a key component for being, moving things forward. Sometimes many of the moments of your work you cannot share with anyone. That's correct. Yeah. So what is it like to be able to get things done and, you, and yet you cannot share the victory? or the success with anyone in words? Well, sometimes you go out and probably you will have one, you will uh, probably cry of Is happiness. Is that the best way for you? Yeah, or sometimes you will go along and walk for several kilometers and, and feel satisfied. And sometimes you will be uh, with your family and you will hug your family and that's it. Are those moments getting ever longer or shorter? I think it's going to be um, shorter and shorter. Because you're becoming more skillful? Bec uh, no, I mean shorter in terms of the number of cases that you have to hold. Because if you look the number of shocks and tensions 
disasters that are happening in Asia, uh, you will face every time a different reality. Uh, if, we, if I was counting today, we are dealing right now as we speak with 21 disaster operations and every single one has a different uh, challenge uh, to deal with. Right behind you, you have a whiteboard over there in a way, writing out all the tasks of your teams here in China and in Asia as to how they are going to do their work. When you are ready, how would you convince them they are all ready? Because many of them are coming from very different walks of life to begin as a volunteer and then work into the organization or very young in age. So how would you be able to do that? Yeah, you know, we invest a lot of our times on what we call the readiness for action. And that means that our teams are not only need to prepare, but they need to, to constantly train and ensure that uh, when the time comes, we are already performing when others will start thinking what to do. Yeah. So uh, readiness becomes part of, of, of the um, DNA of what we need to do as an organization. So that's how you always are, right? Even in the <laughs> office, roll up the sleeve. Even, even in the office. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very Keep much. Keep up the great work. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insights CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see in the Weibo from me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team. Thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. The weekend is up. Time to take it easy. Have a great one, everyone. Bye.